Okay, uh, welcome to round three of Casual Connect. Uh, I'm here to hit you with a, uh, a, a talk, a very overwhelmingly positive talk about uh, how you're going to succeed in the App Store, or not, rather. Um, so a little bit of uh, background on me. So uh, per the introduction, uh, my name's Oliver. Uh, I'm a co-founder and director of a VC-funded company uh, in Bangalore, India. Um, and our team, uh, we hopped over from Zynga. Uh, we specialize in uh, games that can stay, scale to very large proportions. And uh, well, these are some of the games we've worked on uh, in the past. Uh, perhaps some of you have uh, heard of these games, show of hands. Have you heard of them? Yeah, okay, so you've actually played some of the games that uh, we've worked on. Uh, and this presentation is going to be kind of a combination of everything we learned during the course of creating, uh, publishing, and uh, running these games. Yeah. Okay, uh, a bit of self-promotion, but uh, it's actually relevant. Uh, so we just uh, soft launched our first game, uh, Bingo Club, and also uh, we learned a few things along the way doing that. So I'm gonna be using uh, Bingo Club, which is our social casino strategy at Moonfrog, uh, as uh, an example throughout the course of this presentation. Okay, um, so the reason for this uh, for this positive talk um, is because we come to conferences like Casual Connect in order to well ponder over what the formula or recipes for success could be, and our guesses tend to land in these three categories. It could be about uh, acquisition, optimizing your app for the app store, making your game viral, uh, distribution, uh, or perhaps, uh, oh, retaining your users is perhaps more important than anything else. Uh, creating those emotional hooks and uh, incentivizing people to come back, having narrative techniques that really hook your players. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you still need to make money. So uh, there are all manner of uh, monetization techniques that you need to also learn and master. Uh, but despite all of the knowledge, I, I'm, really, I'm a really big fan of us trying to formalize all of this knowledge and bring it all together at conferences like this. Uh, the, but however, the recipe for success is still a vague concept or it still eludes most of us. But what we can be certain of is uh, the recipe for disaster. We all know, uh, uh, we can be certain of how to fail. However, uh, I wanted to make a few rules uh, when I made this list. I wanted to uh, not regurgitate the obvious. I wanted to discount uh, obvious reasons. Uh, you don't need to be told that, uh, well, it, in general, uh, consumers don't like damaged goods. A buggy game is a damaged good. Obviously, it's not going to succeed. Uh, people, uh, well, obviously, people need to see your game in order to play it. You need to surface your game to people, and other, uh, people appreciate well-made games. So let's just get all that out of the way. This is not a list about common sense or the obvious. It's a collection of, uh, I suppose, bits and bobs that, uh, that myself and the team at Moonfrog Labs have learned uh, throughout our uh, I guess, uh, gameography uh, in developing that uh, portfolio. Okay, so let's quickly define the success because that can also be confusing. Um, so the accomplishment of your goal, okay? Uh, let's assume we have positive goals here, like nobody's trying to plan to fail, in which case this would actually be a list on how to succeed in that goal. Um, <laughs> let's try and get, well, Let's try and hit our KPIs and get a top 10 position. Uh, this is also a design talk, by the way. Uh, disclaimer. Um, okay, so without any further ado, you didn't optimize uh, your game economy for acquisition uh, or retention. So game economy, uh, by a, what I mean by game economy is, uh, well, any exchangeable currency, your soft and hard currencies, anything accumulative, anything that you gather um, that cannot be traded. Uh, if you're doing in social casino, it would mean your jackpots, your payouts, 
uh, inflows and outflows, your sinks and injections. Uh, and also, uh, it controls the rate of progression. Okay, so uh, your economy has an immense amount of power uh, over players' emotions. So this is just a, a couple, your spreadsheets, changing a couple of numbers in this spreadsheet can invoke very powerful emotions from your players. Um, so it can make your game feel fair or unfair. It can make you, your game feel cheap. And uh, this is particularly important when you get your first round of users coming in who are perhaps very familiar with your kind of game and are very, uh, I guess, very attuned to how uh, perhaps uh, your, game, like your genre of game should be, uh, should be experienced. So uh, very strong emotions that can, well, will surface through reviews. They're very actionable emotions. If I feel like I've been cheated, I can voice that. Uh, whereas if I'm confused, maybe I, I can't voice that as clearly or transcribe that thought. Uh, so how does this relate to acquisition? Well, this effect is amplified uh, while you're launching. So Everett Rogers uh, in the social sciences terms the, uh, well, your organic users in games, uh, they're called the innovators in every other industry. They're the guys who a, well, who will scour the app store for a new bingo game. They will look for anything new that comes along. Um, and they are also, well, they're enthusiasts, the most in tune um, to uh, that genre. You really should be uh, thinking about your competition and what, they, what experiences they will come to your game. Okay. Uh, so in Bingo Club, for example, um, so we have 50 reviews, and I went through every single one. I stalked every single person uh, I could, and I found that um, they played at least four other bingo games in the uh, previous month, um, and probably owned at least as many cats. So uh, yeah, bad revenue exists. Uh, any kind of revenue that you're making before your game reaches its full po like DAU potential will likely hurt you. Hmm. Uh, mostly because these guys are getting these bad experiences. They're not promoting your game to the next tier of players, which would be the early adopters, whose job it is to then promote your game again to the next tier, which would be the early majority, then the late majority, and then the late majority. Um, so, number nine, your UX. Uh, a lot of games, um, the UX is still stuck in uh, around about 2006, the era sort of when mobile became a thing. Um, it's, it's a, a bit of a rant here. I really don't like virtual buttons. Uh, they, well, it's not the fact that they take up real estate on your screen, uh, but they also limit the area in which a player can interacts like you can only interact with this limited space on your screen I, in fact it's a pretty good uh, des design philosophy to leverage the entire screen um, and if you look at the top 10 apps right now you'll realize that none of them are using just a portion of their screen every single one of them is using the entire screen uh, because that is the best user experience um, so uh, you're using, well, 27% of your screen is covered by your thumbs and buttons. Uh, and also, it doesn't even translate well to portrait, uh, which is, in mobile, that tends to be the primary uh, orientation. Okay. <clears throat> so in the, the, here's an example. So in the early days, uh, developers were trying really hard to create racing games and bring them over to mobile. Um, and they used things like virtual uh, buttons and accelerometers and all this stuff to try and make the racing genre work. Um, uh, and also, I feel like buttons are this sort of layer of abstract uh, abstraction as well. You're pressing a button, which is pushing the accelerator on your car, which ac accelerates your car. It's about too many layers. Uh, mobile players, however, really like that direct action. Um, and then I, I think, uh, well, uh, the 3D runner came along and kind of I feel this was the 
3D racer distilled, optimized, and released for mobile. Uh, it used single input, it used gestures, the entire screen, and gave players direct control. So touchscreens also give us uh, the opportunity to leverage uh, real objects, and this is something everybody should be doing. Uh, and we can, t because we can tap into all this knowledge in uh, product design, uh, namely uh, the principles of universal design, uh, which is uh, well a philosophy um, about well, it's a philosophy that it brings uh, well. Um, sorry. Uh, it is the philosophy that everybody should be able to, well, designing products that have the uh, infinite, well, have in infinite accessibility. So if, if you see a handle, uh, you know that you should be pulling it. Um, there's low physical effort, especially on mobile. Um, you can perceive its function. So on this particular screen, you'll know that this uh, handle will, uh, will pull this box. And uh, it also, um, you also need to give people the size and space to approach. Uh, when in doubt, just emulate your platform. You can be relatively certain that uh, the people playing your game also understand the platform that they're playing on. So look at button sizes, icons, semiotics, dimensions. They're all very helpful. OK, number eight. You tried to outsource your free-to-play game, but did not understand the risks. Um, so, is, does anyone outsource here? Just so I don't like offend anyone. Cool, I'll offend you. Um, so, <laughs> traditional outsourcing in game development is usually about shipping uh, completed assets or completed games, whereas we're in the business of services and servicing games. So, your game needs to be designed to be serviced, and if you go into outsourcing without uh, frameworks in mind, um, then you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have a, a free-to-play game that you'll be unable or perhaps struggle to maintain. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you sagified your game and somehow thought this would guarantee better retention. Um, of, so sagifying for, for the uninitiated. Uh, is a, I mean, it's a bit more complex than this. There are things like viral gates, but it's the process of taking some simple concepts and uh, putting map progression on it, and somehow thinking this is a magical formula that will uh, uh, that will sort of improve your game. Um, <laughs> and it's a way of giving people a sense of progression. It's just, uh, it's essentially an XP bar, but uh, a visually attractive. Uh, so, sagafying actually doesn't guarantee you anything, and Candy Crush is not popular because it has a map. I'm sure like, uh, everyone should realize this, but nobody seems to realize this. Um, in fact, putting a map on your game uh, could have a negative effect. Um, I mean, I actually have very particular experience in this. Um, you're, unless you hand people off from like, one level to the other very, very smoothly, then you're actually going to have an increased drop-off between your level nodes. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, you targeted an emerging market that you did not understand. Uh, this one's particular for Casual Connect Asia. Um, so us at Moonfrog Labs, uh, we are 99% uh, Indian, um, <laughs> and we do not represent the majority of Indians. Uh, we all have smartphones. In fact, uh, just looking at all the data, uh, we represent actually 4% of the overall Indian population uh, that lives in a metropolitan area. Um, there are a lot of mobile phones, uh, well, smartphones specifically, uh, coming into the mobile market in India, and most of those will be in rural areas, uh, urban areas, semi-urban areas. So not us. If we were to make a game for India, we might not even like, understand who those players are. They're not like a different context. 
so for those people who are just buying a mobile phone, uh, everything goes out the window. Um, we, In game design, we've worked hard to build up genres and complexity uh, in our games. But uh, <laughs> the, that doesn't exist anymore because these guys' uh, point of entry is, uh, is through apps. This point of entry into games in general. So uh, things like semiotics, uh, those symbols that we're all used to, may not mean anything anymore. Uh, if anyone knows the hamburger icon, it's like uh, three lines, one on top of the other. We know what that means, uh, but I, I doubt that um, uh, people in emerging markets would understand or really recognize it. Things like pencils, however, pretty universal. We'd probably get away with that. OK. Uh, your audience uh, is probably a whole lot more diverse than you think they are. Uh, I was looking at, uh, well, I was researching Thailand recently. Um, there's about 72 languages in Thailand. I, I did not know that. And uh, I think two of them are actually official. So, <laughs> so uh, this, if this is important for discoverability, what people are searching for uh, in that region. And of course, uh, if you're catering to an emerging market, nobody's probably catered to them before. They're just happy you're there. You don't have to make a, a triple A, well, double A, whatever, quality game in order to satisfy them. You can actually get stuff out quite faster and have them be satisfied. So yeah, in India, you can lower the price of onions and become president. Um, <laughs> by uh, catering to the majority, uh, you will capture the market. But uh, you'll probably alienate those in the metropolitan areas who don't care about the prices of onions. So you're not going to please everybody. You'll be specifically aiming those guys with new smartphones. OK. Uh, I don't think I have much time, so I'll just quickly go through the recipes. Um, this one isn't a reason you'll fail. It's actually a reason you'll stumble. <laughs> um, so. It makes sense these days when looking at uh, tablet penetration versus smartphone and monetization on tablet uh, for a developer to go ahead and target a game towards tablet. And then when it comes to the soft launch phase, you'll think, hey, uh, I should be soft launching on a tablet device, possibly on Android. And the, the data may indicate that that is a sound strategy. Um, and this is in the US, by the way. Um, so it's almost an even split by on the surface. Uh, but when you dig a little deeper, you'll realize that 33% of the uh, Android share is actually Amaz owned by Amazon entirely. So if you're launching on Android, you're, you're actually giving it to a very small percentage of people. Um, and furthermore, if you look at web traffic, uh, Apple, well, tablet web traffic, Apple uh, is far and away uh, the most busy, I guess, uh, you know, device used there. So I'm not sure what people are using their Android tablets for, but it, it ain't games or ain't internet. Um, <laughs> so you, what you may end up is something looking like this. Uh, you soft launch on, uh, on your Android device and it's like, oh, um, th this experience that I made for tablet is actually only 7% of uh, my test market. Uh, everyone else is not getting the optimal experience that I designed for. Uh, my session length, well, the session length is uh, more fragmented than I expected them to, and uh, uh, my data might be a bit unreliable because uh, player behaviors are slightly different from what I expected. Uh, so you'll spend your soft launch probably creating a mobile experience instead of looking at your data. So uh, optimizing for the wrong uh, metric. Uh, I've seen a lot of teams do this. Um, uh, during our experience. So uh, it feels really good to, while, while you're a small company, while you're growing, uh, to, uh, I guess, rally behind a single digit and celebrate when it starts to grow. But then you fail to realize that <laughs> there are other factors that you should be considering. You should be looking at all your data and bringing it together and having that as a, a, a bearing for your success. So what does it matter if your DAU is high? your ratings are low. Uh, how do you measure engagement in one metric? I'm not quite sure. Uh, every game is different. Uh, there's session length, there's player actions. You should be looking at all of these. 
And then uh, when it comes down to revenue, uh, it doesn't really reflect the overall value of your inventory of your game, which would be your book. Um, okay, so you didn't, another important thing, you need to ask people to share in their first session. If you don't do this, uh, then I think you're on a rocky road. Um, so some reasoning behind this. So this is the funnel. Uh, this is not your FTUE funnel. This is the funnel of people who've seen your ad or your icon and then clicked on it and then arrived at your game. So first of all, you get their attention, uh, your game appeals to them, uh, and at that point when your game has appealed to that particular person, it's a really important uh, time because then they may feel inclined to share it. Uh, if you're not asking them, then you may be losing out. Uh, because, uh, well, you see headlines like this, like, is obesity contagious? Uh, well, no, actually, obesity is not contagious. It's just that people tend to, uh, there's people's social net, tend to surround themselves with others of similar, in who have similar interests, whether they're positive or negative. So if somebody likes your game, it's more likely that they'll have friends that uh, have, uh, well, also like your game. So you'll see in, like, this is my social graph, I guess. Uh, my friends are all like, well, are clumping together who uh, have similar interests, who've all liked the same page on Facebook, for example. Um, so yeah, you are the average of the five, five people you spend the most time with. Please get your, uh, that person who you've spent money on getting to your game and uh, getting through your funnel to share with their immediate network. Okay, uh, don't over pivot to what's me measurable. Uh, so it was quite interesting. Uh, we talk about UX and how metrics can be an indicator of what a player is experiencing, but even after you've collected all of this data, you still will not know very basic things about your game, such as how the player feels while they're playing, which is super important. Uh, and of course you can, uh, it's very difficult to actually get an answer to that. You can ask people, um, <laughs> but how good do you think people are at describing uh, how they feel while they're playing? Uh, not very. You can look at reviews, you can look at feedback from the community, uh, but at the same time, it's probably the most critical thing that you should be tracking in your game. And uh, you should not ignore it, you should not be too deep in the data. At Moonfrog, we're actually very data orientated. Uh, analytics driven, but we still uh, work hard to Okay, and your game is not Flappy Bird, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, this is sort of the point of this entire talk. Uh, we're all pondering over the, uh, the recipe for success, uh, the formula, but I can bet you that the formula that you have in your mind applies to, uh, I mean, one successful game and maybe 50 unsuccessful games. So uh, here's the full recipe. Yeah, so, so you know, tweet away, plus away, whatever. And hopefully you can take this list uh, and empowered with this knowledge, uh, you will have 10 reasons why your app will succeed. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>